I asked Brother Jack to read this passage from Job chapter 42 because of what it says in verse 12. Verse 12 it says, The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Job's life at the end was better than it had been at the beginning. I want to unpack that a little bit, but first let's just quickly review the middle of Job's life, or the part that's most closely recorded from us. Job is described as an upright man, a man of integrity, a man of the East, and he was fabulously wealthy. He had seven sons and three daughters. He had thousands of heads of several different kinds of livestock. He had servants. And he was really, really well respected. He was influential. He was powerful. And he was good. He was an upright and trustworthy man. God allowed Satan to take almost everything that Job had killed all ten of his children, took all of his livestock, all of his holdings, and even took his health. Covered his body in painful sores, in painful boils. And then Job's friends come to him to console him, but what they wind up doing is they keep saying to him, Job, this is your own fault. Job, this is because of your sin. And Job said, no it's not. Job says, I wish I could die. I wish I had never been born. I wish I could explain to God why this is unfair. That was Job's attitude. I'll give you an example. Job chapter 27, verse 5. Job is speaking and his friends, and the bulk of the book of Job is a poem where Job's friends and Job are arguing back and forth. And one of the friends will make an argument of why Job has brought his suffering on himself because of sin, and then Job will argue back that that's just not true. Well, Job 27 verse 5 is an example of, of one of the arguments that Job is making. And he says in verse 5, Far be it from me that I should declare you right, talking to his friends. Far be it from me that I should say to you, my friend, you're right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach any of my days. Job is saying, I don't regret anything that I've done. Job is saying, I have not brought this on myself. This is not because I've been hiding some secret sin. That's Job's attitude. Then toward the end of the book, chapter 38, God speaks to Job. And there's a huge storm. End of verse 37 describes a storm, but you don't really realize that it's a presently happening storm. But then in chapter 38 it says, then God speaks to Job from the storm. God intervenes in this argument between this horrifically miserable, grief-stricken man and these three friends who are trying to explain to him that when bad things happen to you, it's because you did something bad. Well, well, God speaks in chapter 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel without knowledge, by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And for four chapters, God verbally challenges Job with similar statements. If you come forward to chapter 40, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then down in verse 6 of Job 40, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you, and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? 
Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like His? God's answer to Job is this. You, sir, are in no position to question me. God's response is, I don't have to explain it to you. I don't have to tell you. You have no right to say that I don't have a right to do whatever I do. God's response is, don't question my judgment because you don't know. You don't know what I know and you can't do what I've done. So don't come here telling me that I'm wrong. That's God's, that's God's attitude. It's a very negative statement for four chapters that God makes for Job to Job. But then, in chapter 42, it changes. We get the rest of the story, the end of the story. 140 years more, Job lives. Job lives another 140 years. God gives him seven more sons three more daughters, and double the amount of livestock and holdings that he had had before. And that's verse 12. And so Job, the end of Job's days, uh, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Even though God says, don't question me. Even though God says, you're in no position to say that what I have done is not right. God still gives us the reassurance that He will make it up to us at the end. And so you have this record of Job's restored family and his brothers and sisters coming to him. What do you think Job's attitude was like after he recovered from his illness and God restored the happiness in his life. Don't you think he savored a day differently? When he's having a meal with a loved one, don't you think he values it differently? When he walks out of his house in the morning and he smells the brisk air and he sees the clear light, don't you think he thinks, wow, it's good to feel good. It's good to be healthy. It's good to be able to walk. Job was better off at the end in a lot more ways than one than he was at the beginning. But here's the principle that I want us to focus in on. This is how it always is with God. When you're going through the problems when you're going through the suffering, when you're having the difficulty, you may not understand. And God may never provide you with a clear explanation. There's no record that God ever told Job, Job, it's because Satan attacked you that you lost all of these things. There's no record that God ever told Job, Job, I'm going to use your example to bless my people for thousands and thousands of years into the future. And tens of hundreds of millions of people are going to benefit from the lessons in your life. No indication that God ever explained that to Job. But that was God's plan all along. God always makes up for it, even when you can't see it. And we see this principle frequently in the New Testament. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. 
God makes that promise to us. Jesus makes that promise to us because that's how it is when you deal with God. It may involve loss. It may involve, quite frankly, it practically always involves hardship, difficulty, persecutions. Having to leave that which you thought was yours, that which you thought was what you wanted, that, was wh that which you thought you were entitled to. And then God restores it in a better way in His own time. With persecutions. But the goal is eternal life. Jesus says a hundred times as much. Job got double. Job got double the possessions that he had before. Jesus says in the kingdom of heaven it's a hundred. Not times two, it's times a hundred. That's a fantastic promise that is supposed to sustain us when we're called on to make difficult sacrifices. When we're called on to choose God in a way that may cost us earthly blessings. To understand that you never outpay God. But this principle is limited to good. You don't always have a better end than the beginning if you don't do things God's way. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Some people come to church, or go to church, frequently. There's a lot of people who go to church once a week, or even more frequently, but who sow more seed to the flesh than they do to the Spirit. You can come to church and still be a person who emphasizes the earthly, who emphasizes the physical blessings in your life, who emphasizes the here and now, and fails to emphasize, to prioritize the eternal, the spiritual, that which lasts forever. But it is exact, I mean, God uses, Jesus uses the same analogy that Paul uses here, in Galatians 6, when it's like seed. If your seed is focused on earthly things, if your energy, if your time, if your money, if your creativity is focused on fleshly things, then you will reap corruption. But if it's focused on spiritual things, if it's focused on eternal things, if it's focused on love and truth and salvation and faith and compassion, you will reap eternal life. God always repays. He always expands it at the end. Like one seed produces hundreds or thousands of fruit. The same is true of the seed we sow today. Spiritual or physical. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. If you're living in sin, if you're walking in the world, if you're living with a fleshly mind that only what's here and now and only what you can see and feel and taste is important, wages of sin is death. Wages of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh is corruption. There are a lot of different applications of this same principle. Go with me to Mark chapter 8. Understanding that what you do today affects what you will have in the future. And that if you live for God today, the end of that service and that commitment will be far better than anything else you could ever have. It changes the way you look at the world. It makes the whole world and everything in the world fit into a different picture. 
It organizes things into important and unimportant simply by its relationship to God's eternal purposes. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus summoned the crowd with His disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for My sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the classic text, right? This is the classic Scripture that most people remember. What will a man give? What is, it prof- what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Jesus says to think that you can save your own life, to think that you can control your life, that you can ensure your own safety, that you can carve your own path, that you can create your own destiny. He says that is a horrific error. If you want a good life, if you want a good future, if you want safety and security and peace and satisfaction, how does it happen? You've got to give up your life. It's a paradox. It seems backwards. But you have to entrust your life to Him. You have to realize, if I control it, I'm going to lose it. If I trust myself, I'm going to, cr- I'm going to crush it. I'm going to, I'm going to destroy it. But if I entrust it to Him, if I give it over to Him, it'll be better than I could have ever imagined. And so it changes everything. It changes the way you look at money. changes the way you look at your job. changes the way you look at your neighbors. changes the way you look at your spouse. changes the way you look at your children. changes everything. I give my life to God. I follow His Word. I adopt His will. I try to get rid of my own will. Because if I don't, I'm going to lose it all. And this makes it... It also changes how you look at other people and how you look at people who treat you poorly, how you look at people who are unfair, hurt you in some way. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Jesus says, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. You see what he's getting at, right? You want to hold everybody to a standard of perfection. I deserve forgiveness, you deserve justice, right? That's our normal way of looking at the world. I deserve leeway. I've got reasons why I don't always act perfectly, but you don't. That seems to be the attitude of a lot of people. And Jesus is saying, be really careful. Because if you want leeway, if you want grace, if you want forgiveness, if you want second chance after second chance for messing up, then you better be given it. You better be given it. If you value forgiveness, if you value salvation, you better be giving forgiveness. You better be willing to associate with people who are imperfect and fall short and make mistakes and sometimes just flat choose to do wrong. Because that's what you've done and that's what you want from God. And so be careful about your condemnation. Be careful about telling people that they're beyond redemption. Because you don't want to be told the same thing. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured back to you. But if you do that, if you become a person who says, it's okay, you can treat me wrong, I've done wrong, and I'm not going to try to kill you for treating me poorly. If you become a person who can say to a person, I wish you hadn't done that. 
But more than that, I want you to be close to God. And I want you to be my brother or sister in Christ. If you can be a person who emphasizes and promotes forgiveness to other people, well, look at the benefit of that. The end is better than the beginning. The end is bigger than the beginning. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured back to you. Jesus says you can't outgive God. Once you become a giving, forgiving, open person, God just pours it into your lap. It's like more than you can hold. It overflows. That's the picture He's painting there in Luke chapter 6. Finally, this principle is seen in Scripture when it comes to money. And when it comes to how you associate your money with the church or with the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 talks about contribution. talks about giving money for the work of the church. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here's the principle. God gives you the choice. God says, I'm not going to give you a formula. I'm not going to give you a clear accounting statement by which you can calculate down to the penny how much you should give. He says, you give what you've decided in your heart. Because what I want is somebody who wants to give. I want somebody who is made happy by the opportunity to give, a cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. You see what he's saying? If you give, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do more good. I'm going to give you the wherewithal to do more good. If I have cheerful givers, I'm going to give those people good things that they can give money to. And you're going to have that much more cheer. Verse 9, as it is written, He scattered abroad, He gave to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Just like Job, those who remain committed to God, those who remain faithful to God, even through persecution, even through adversity, even through the loss, grief, poverty, loss of health, those who remain faithful... God rewards. And this is not a prosperity gospel. That's the kind of gospel that Job's friends would teach. Job's friends was, would say, you're experiencing bad, therefore you did bad. I'm experiencing good, therefore I did good. That is not true. That is not how the Bible works. That is not what the Bible teaches. But what the Bible teaches is, if you'll remain faithful even when it's bad and even when it's not fair, God will far more than make it up to you. And the end will be better than the beginning. What a beautiful promise. What a beautiful picture of what God is willing to do. If you haven't committed yourself to God, if you haven't been living in faith, if you haven't been living a life that shows your dedication to Him, you need to change. If you've never come to Christ for the first time, you can do it this morning. Come to Christ confessing your faith in Him, repenting of your sins to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.